She was killed a little bit before Christmas, and for more than 60 years this case remains unsolved. This is the story of Eli Maria Immo from Finland. Hello my friends, welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, my name is Gita, Gita Lighthouse, and I'm that girl who makes different videos about Scandinavian cases. I tell stories, mysteries, true crime, interesting facts or funny facts that you didn't know, but yet it is interesting to know. So I share them. If you are into that, do make sure you have subscribed to my channel to stay updated with everything that I'm telling. That being said, today's case will be related to Christmas, since this the season. And unfortunately, this will not be a happy story. This will be a murder case that is unsolved. And it will be related to Christmas, first of all, because it happened before Christmas. Second of all, it comes from a place that is usually associated as the house of Santa Claus, namely Lapland in Finland. Eli Maria Immo was born in the year 1935, August the 10th, in a place called Alatornio. This place is located on the Finnish-Swedish border in a Finnish Lapland. Her childhood we cannot call that a happy one since she experienced World War II. Her family consisted of father, mother, and she also had three younger brothers. Ellie's father worked as a policeman and he was mainly dealing with different smugglers who were like smuggling things through the border. And uh, at one point when Ellie was only 15 years old, her father suddenly died. After father's death, the family moved away from their initial location where they lived. They moved around 30 kilometers away from that place to a small industrial city called Kemi. Now they were living in a detached house. They were renting that, like the second floor of it. And also they had a room in a sauna building. And uh, their house was around 30 minutes walk from the city center. Kemi was a city that uh, definitely was bigger than the place where she lived before and Ellie really enjoyed life there. So now she was quite close to the center, which meant that she could go to cinemas, she loved attending dances, she was going to cafes with her friends, she attended Kemi School of Economics and also she was working a part-time job in a wallpaper and paint store. So it was December 7th, 1955. This was the day when Ellie's life was abrupted very suddenly. So the day started as usual. She left her home at 8 a.m. for school. And at school, her friends said that she was very happy and excited. And she eagerly told everyone that the day before, in the previous evening, she had attended a very nice Christmas party that was around eight kilometers from the center. And there she said she laughed a lot. And there were so many men that she could dance with. While Ellie was still at school on that day, her mom left for work. She usually left at around 1 p.m. and in the afternoon when the house was already empty because her brothers were not also home, uh, she came home and as usual she heated the house, she left her school bag and started to do some homework. When I said uh, her brothers were not home, it was because one of the brothers was attending obligatory military service and two of the other brothers were attending a uh, kids' Christmas party, and they were supposed to be home at around 9 p.m. Ellie had a friend, and her name was Myla. She had known her for three years. Uh, they met once in a dance party, and since then, they just somehow hit it off and became very good friends. So on that day, Myla appeared on her doorstep, and she said, come on, Ellie, let's go to the center. Let's do some fun. And of course, Ellie agreed to that. The young girl put on a trench coat, rubber boots, woolen gloves and wool crocheted hat, which she had made herself. Both of the girls then walked to the city center by taking a shortcut, a footpath, from the street where Ellie lived. On their way to the city center, they met another friend. Her name was Annalisa. And apparently uh, Ellie had already made plans with Annalisa. So for her, it was not surprised that she met her. So now there were three young women going to the city center. When they reached the city center, they just hanged around. They thought they're gonna go to cinema, but they couldn't agree on a film. So they ended up in some bar and uh, afterwards in a cafe. And then when they went out, 
out one of the friends, Smila, actually saw the clock that was outside, I guess, on the church or on a building. And she said like, wow, it's really freezing. My feet are freezing. It's already 9 p.m. I think I should go home. So Ellie said goodbye to her friend Annalisa. And she, together with Myla, both went back to the home like direction again together. So both of the young women were walking until they reached one junction between uh, two streets that they could choose where to go. Myla suggested that they should take the street that is more lighter, that it had like more lights and she felt that it would be more safer. However, Ellie said, no, let's just take the other one. It's shorter and the fact that it's dark, I mean, there are two of us, everything's gonna be all right. So they took the dark street. So they were walking and when they were walking uh, on this darker street, they passed a footpath that actually led to Ellie's house. But she decided that she could walk along with Myla a little bit further closer to her home and then return back and go home to the footpath that will lead her to her home. So that was her decision. I mean, we all, all had friends with whom we like to chat. So we sometimes like go with them a little bit further just to end up the conversation or something. So it's nothing so unusual, I guess. They passed this footpath walking a little bit further, both of them. And I guess they walked around 250 meters further. And that was the place when Ellie said, OK, then goodbye, my friend, I'm going home. Uh, have a safe uh, walk back to your home i'm going back so at that time the clock showed at around 9 25 p.m or 9 30 p.m so they were in the center at 9 p.m and the moment when they were parted when they both were quite close to their homes was 9 25 to 9 30 around that time so logically ellie was supposed to go back those 250 meters take the foot bath and be home but unfortunately she didn't reach her home on that evening at around 9 45 later on a neighbor who was living in that area told the police that at 9 45 she heard a woman's voice screaming very loudly but she didn't pay attention to that since you know it was christmas party time and she thought it's just like another like reckless young people coming home from a christmas party and making some noise in the streets so she didn't really check what happened outside and who was screaming Two hours later, and it was already 11.45 p.m., Ellie's mother was coming home from her evening shift. Her work has ended. And she was taking the same footpath where Ellie was supposed to go home. And she didn't see anything suspicious on the street. Ellie's mother comes in in the house. She sees that her sons have already returned from their Christmas party, sleeping uh, soundly in their beds. So if we recall, they were supposed to be like home at around 9 p.m. So apparently they were also taking the same path at around 9, 9.30 if we just like think logically about that. But uh, Ellie's mother wasn't worried uh, that she didn't see Ellie at home. And there was a good reason because sometimes when she was going out with her girlfriends, she stayed over for the night at Annalisa's. Remember one of the three friends was Myla and the second was Annalisa. So she thought maybe she was uh, staying there. So she didn't worry a lot about that. I mean, like, just to compare, you know, like it was 1950s and nowadays all the kids have mobile phones and you can just text and learn about their whereabouts a lot earlier. In those times, people didn't know so much, yet they were so calm about things that they shouldn't be so calm, I guess. The following day, and it was already December the 8th, a schoolboy at around 12.45 p.m. discovers a woman's body laying in the snow and covered with the snow. This body unfortunately belonged to Ellie. This body was nearby a rock and it was 2.3 meters away from the footpath that she was supposed to take for her way to home. So she was outside the footpath on the way or the road where she was walking together with Myla and then she was supposed to take the same road back to go on the footpath and go home. The poor girl had stab wounds in her face, neck, throat, also on the back 
However, she wasn't sexually assaulted. The purpose of the attacker certainly wasn't a robbery, since in her purse, Ellie was carrying quite a large sum of money. She had like 1,000 Finnish marks with her and they were still in the purse. And also she had still on her watch and she also was wearing a golden ring. But the most terrible thing is that she was found only 30 meters away from her own home. So she was so close to her home and she had like slash marks on her gloves. Apparently she was fighting with her hands against the knife that the attacker had. All of these gloves now were slashed and soaked with her blood. Police arrived and they started to search the area around. What they find is a, like a knife cover, you know, which is like a purse where you put a knife so that it's like protected and is not dangerous or something like that. And it was from a brand called Mora. Also uh, around the area nearby the body, they found bicycle marks and also large footprints, which kind of signify that a attacker could be a guy because of the large footprints. But then again, it's not very objective conclusion. A week later, and it was around December 15th, somebody handed in to the police a Mura knife that had been found in one of the long distance buses that was like commuting between Kemi and other cities uh, nearby. And it looked like that could be that knife, although the police were not not sure since it didn't have any marks that could signify that that was used uh, for stabbing Ellie. And also another thing that many Finns actually were carrying around uh, Mora brand knives. It was nothing special in that area. The police tried to find the owner of the knife that they found in the bus. So they put it outside, I guess, on the newspaper and they announced for the owner to just uh, speak up and uh, come and get their knife but nobody appeared obviously i guess they understood that uh they might be then suspected with the case so whoever was the owner of the nice knife it just didn't appear also uh an important thing in, is and also quite suspicious that the timing for the murder to take place uh, nearby this footpath was very very tight like if we recall then at 9 p.m. the brothers were coming home and they actually claimed that they had like uh, flashlights but they didn't see anything suspicious on the footpath and around it. Uh, also one person came forward and said that uh, they were taking uh, the footpath at around 8.30 p.m. so before the brothers and again they didn't see anything suspicious and then this woman who was hearing the woman's voice screaming at around 9.30 up to 9.45 or 50. Uh, I mean it must have been Ellie. It must have been the time when it happened. Also, another witness came forward saying that she was passing the footpath at around 9.45, which would be around the time when that other lady heard the scream. And then the same witness also said that her daughter was cleaning snow at around 10 minutes past 10 p.m. And like she didn't do it like for five minutes. She was standing there for a while since she was cleaning the snow and she also didn't see anything suspicious. The police also, of course, talked to Myla, the friend that supposedly was the last person who saw her alive. And uh, Myla revealed that actually Ellie was quite weird during that day. Usually she was, you know, this outgoing, very talkative person who was always sharing her ideas, thoughts, and you know, like that person, when you say like when, when the person comes in, the whole building is brightened up by her presence. That was Ellie. But on that specific day, she was quite quiet and it looked like something was bothering her. But that was what Myla said. But when the police talked to the other friend, uh, the Annalisa, with whom uh, they were in the center on that day, she also confirmed the same, that she felt the same, like something was bothering Ellie. Did something happen the previous night when she was on that Christmas party? We don't know, but you know, she came to school and she was excited. She was telling about that. But it was that evening when she was just like, something was in her mind. 
Also, the police went quite suspicious about Myla, the friend, because she was the last one who saw her. But uh, she did really reach the home on that evening because she said when she came home, she was listening to this radio uh, show uh, and she actually described everything that she heard on that radio show. That was kind of her alibi because, you know, in those times they didn't have like YouTube and social media. They listened to radio. And uh, since she could describe what she was hearing and it was accurate, they discarded the suspicion towards the friend. For the case, the police questioned around 60 people and the file about Ellie's disappearance reached more than 100 pages. Of course, they had some suspects, including Myla, as I said before, but she was cleared. Also, they were suspecting some truck driver who also kind of looked quite weird on that evening, but he had a solid alibi as it appeared afterwards. So all of this reached a dead end and the case remained unsolved. What is interesting about this case, when I dug a little bit deeper, it appeared that two years before Ellie was murdered, another girl was killed around 500 kilometers away from the place where Ellie died. A 17-year-old Finnish girl called Kilikisari, I hope I pronounced that name correctly, she was killed on a rural road a couple of kilometers away from her home, which kind of rings a bell looks like similar to Ellie's case. What is interesting about both of these cases of Ellie and Kiliki is that they both were killed late in the evening while they were just taking the last steps towards their home after separating with their female friends. And the case of Kiliki was taking place on the May 17th, 1953. And also Kiliki's case was unsolved and went cold. So we have two young women killed in the same, almost the same circumstances, and nobody could find anyone. An interesting thing is that this didn't stop there. In the year 1959, two other Finnish women were killed in the circumstances where they should have been safe. A 23-year-old woman named Rita Auliki Pakkanen and 21-year-old Eine Maria Nisonen, I hope I pronounced it correctly, were murdered while they were camping in Tulilahti, Eastern Finland. I don't know how about you guys, but for me it kind of smells like a serial killer. And it was done like with a couple of years um, apart and young girls, the pattern looks the same. So it could be a serial killer. I mean, I've covered so many cases and it really looks like this is the one. However, in the year 1959, the same year when the Tuli Lahti girls were murdered, they finally arrest the first suspect. So it was a 35-year-old criminal and his name was Erik Runar Holstrom and they charged him with the double murder of both of these girls in Tuli Lahti. Just so you understand, the case of Tuli Lahti girls was also very gross and terrible. We are looking into Ellie's case, but I will just give you an insight into Lilahti case. So both of these girls, while they were camping, they were literally dragged out of their tents, killed, and then the murderer was just dropping them in a and I, I don't know, like it's, it was a grave that he made and this grave was in a swamp. And it happened in the middle of a night. Again, late night, the same pattern. It really looked like this uh, Hallstrom was guilty of Tuli Lahti murders because uh, later on he also revealed that yes, he did follow those girls on his moped, like he was a creepy guy, but he didn't really admit of killing them. And in the year 1960, the police started to ask Hallstrom questions also about Ellie's case. And I guess it was a smart move to kind of connect to the dots. And uh, they also found out that Holstrom actually was uh, having uh, this Mora brand knife with whom Ellie was killed. And this knife was missing the cover um, that was found uh, on the murder place. But of course, we don't know that 
that's the same cover that is missing but still like strange coincidence but what holstrom said is that he acquired this knife only in 1959 but the murder of ellie took place in 1955 but again it's just talking there were no like solid evidence all of this was just assumptions so they couldn't actually tie him to ellie's case but then some witnesses actually started to come forward saying that they saw a man that matched the description of Holstrom the night before Ellie was killed in the area where she was living and the description really matched uh, the way how Holstrom looked in real life. So the description was that the man who was walking in the area the day before Ellie was murdered was like a tanned round-faced man at around 160 up to 165 meters tall and supposedly he was asking to one of those witnesses who came forward about where is the closest phone booth because he had to make a phone call and he looked quite suspicious according to what the witnesses said but how about holstrom's alibi so he said that he was actually not in that area not the day before not on the day when ellie was killed he said that he was at home he mentioned that he had some guests but he couldn't actually prove that so in general he didn't have any alibi but uh, then something strange happened in the year 1960 when holstrom was going on a trial for the talilachti girl murder Another murder took place, and it was a triple murder. Three camper girls were killed uh, in Lake Bodom Espo in the southern Finland. So was this related to all of the previous girls, or was it this something separate? Just makes things even more confusing. And as I said, Holstrom was already in the jail and uh, trialed for those killings. So what was happening there? But then another shocking thing happened. It was May of year 1961. Holstrom um, ends up his life on himself. He does the thing on the letter S while he is in the jail in Vasa. He did this even before he received the verdict about him being charged with Tali Lachti girl, girl's murder and even before police managed to charge him uh, and start to really investigate him in relation to Ellie's case. We now cannot really know what happened if this guy did this because he felt so guilty and ashamed about what he had did to those girls or maybe he wasn't guilty and this is why he was so desperate and did this and even let's say he was guilty of tali Lakti girls because you know apparently he already confessed that he was following them on a moped he might have just taken with him to the grave the secret about Ellie, if he was actually even related to that case. An interesting thing started to appear in the year 1972, so it's a, a lot of years after Ellie was killed in 1955. Two of the Kemi police uh, department policemen, two of the three that were involved in the investigation of Ellie's case, started to like go around and say that you know we should reopen the case of ellie because uh we know that the police was actually protecting the real murderer uh when the investigation was taking place in the year 1955 however they never officially made some kind of like claim for the case to be reopened so were they afraid of something or they were just you know like walking around and talking uh, bs and uh, i don't know but what was the reason then for saying something like that my idea is that maybe this um, theory of the policeman actually being involved in protecting somebody who might as well also be a policeman who is actually a murderer i believe that that could be valid 
and both of those policemen, they maybe started to talk, but then they were shut up by somebody more important. So this is why it officially didn't go anywhere further in the 1972. So this just makes me think that maybe there was a serial killer, maybe that person was close to the police or was a policeman. And this is why all of this never got anywhere and uh, Holstrom was just very convenient and he also did suicide so all of the ends are just like leading nowhere except for the last case the girls in Espo was it even related too many questions here so all in all I'm just like thinking um, it happened a long time ago and if uh, the policemen had maybe the forensic tools that we have now, all of the DNA science that we have now, this case would have gone a lot further uh, with uh, all of the evidence that they had. And also, just in my mind, it just I just cannot like make peace in my mind about the timing when Ellie was killed. Like, all of the witnesses, it seemed like they were so close around the time when Ellie was killed. One was cleaning snow, another one was passing the same footpath. Even the brothers were around during that time. And if Ellie was screaming, why, why didn't they hear that? Why there was just only one lady who actually heard somebody screaming and not the other people who were living in the neighborhood? For me, it just sounds very, very weird. Maybe if we consider the option that a policeman was involved, maybe somebody just shut up all of the other witnesses who wanted to speak up. And also, according to the timeline with all of the witnesses, it seems like the murder took place during like three to five minutes so quick because there was no time gap to do that. It's so weird. Also, a logic question is, why would the murderer choose actually to murder someone during the time when the street and the footpath around it, when it's so busy, like full of people, when they're coming from Christmas parties, cleaning snow and stuff, why would a murderer choose a time like that? There are so many mysteries around this case and it just, I just cannot keep my mind peaceful when I start to think about that. So. This is the case of Ellie, which actually stretches out as, in my opinion, as a serial killer uh, case in Finland. So now it's time for you guys to write down in comments what are you thinking about this case. Maybe you have some other thoughts about who would have been guilty here. And that being said, I hope you will enjoy your Christmas. I hope you're ready for Christmas because it's close. I am ready, you know, and... Uh, Enjoy your holidays, uh, stay happy, stay safe. Always look around yourself when you go out in the dark. Even if it's Christmas, things might happen. This case is an example. And I don't want to scare you. I just want to tell you I love you all, each and everyone who is subscribing to my channel. See you next time.